In this lecture, I'm going to look at the concepts of participatory and deliberative democracy. There's the title of the lecture. Um, and uh, I'm going to do that through the lens of contrasting these concepts in democratic theory with uh, republicanism, otherwise known as representative democracy, the Madisonian model of democracy. So I'm going to start by talking about uh, what the uh, essentially the early American and early Western version of what democracy is supposed to be about, which is the representative democracy model, the Madisonian model. Uh, and as a way of then talking about what the advocates of participatory and deliberative democracy are looking for that's different from the Madisonian model. I've started with the, uh, with the diagram of what the Madisonian model looks like, and this should be relatively familiar to you from the previous modules, but I'm going to go through it uh, anyway as a way of sort of uh, showing what it is that participatory and deliberative democracy are attempting to modify and uh, advance and in a particular direction. So what we have in a uh, standard Madisonian model is an electoral system and a system of governance. And uh, the um, thing that happens is there are elections and the winners are the representatives and the representatives then aggregate the interests they represent in terms of creating policy outcomes within the confines of the system of checks and balances. And this is an ongoing process it's linear in this sense, but it's an ongoing process because what we end up getting here is people, representatives have the end of their term. And so we have a cycling back and forth between the electoral system and the system of governance. And then policy outcomes happen when they happen, right? Uh, and the idea here is that the relationship between these systems and the people who are seeking to advance their interests, this is the underlying assumption of the Madisonian model, is that what the people want is to advance their interests. It's an interest-based theory of politics. Um, and uh, while Madison was not the first or, or most prominent, or first, excuse me, not the first one to advocate this idea, he is sort of the most prominent American advocate uh, of this notion that democratic politics is essentially a struggle among interest groups, he called them factions, uh, to advance their interests through the mechanisms of uh, our government, which is composed of the electoral system and the system of governance. The relationship between the people and these two systems is relatively narrow in the Madisonian model. Part of the uh, idea of republicanism is that the people don't have a very vigorous presence in the overall system. They are off to the side. And what are their two essential uh, uh, influence points? Primary, voting, right? And this is periodic. The people get to vote periodically. And because of the end of term, it happens routinely. But it's, I put periodic, but I could also put sporadic. Your life as a voter is very sporadic. You're always part of the people, but you're not always uh, going to be engaged in that life as a voter. And the voting act is also quite uh, a limited one because you get to decide a very narrow set of questions from a very narrow set of options, right? In the United States, at the national level, when you go to vote, you get to, at best, vote for one representative in the House of Representatives, one senator at a time, though you have two senators that represent you, and one uh, president. Um, that's it. That's what you get to vote for. Those are our choices that we get to that, that allow us to influence what goes on in the national government. At the state and local level, we have more choices. The ballot consists of more things, but there really are not, even with a larger ballot, the, the, the interface between the people and policy outcomes via the vote is a very narrow one. Now, I've said this before, but I, what, but I think it always bears repeating. Despite the fact that this is a very thin nexus between the people and the government, we tend to think of that as the primary democratic mechanism. Uh, we have a very ballot-centric uh, view of democracy. And the, the ballot is, of course, an extremely important mechanism, but because it's periodic and sporadic, and because it only comes with a narrow range of questions and options, it is not an extraordinarily potent connection between the people and the democratic system. Now, even in the Madisonian model, which does focus a lot on the vote, the people are really fundamentally seen as voters, 
they also have the other opportunity to advocate in the governance system. And this is an ongoing process. Um, now, the number of people who vote is less than 100% by far. The number of people who advocate is far from 100% of the people who actually vote. And so one of the things about the Madisonian model is that essentially there is an outsourcing of an awful lot of things uh, that, that lead to policy outcomes. One, the very notion of, of representative democracy in the first place is that the people are going to outsource policy decisions to the system of governance, their representatives, right? Uh, and two, mostly p the voters are going to outsource, at, or excuse me, the people are going to um, outsource choosing the representatives to whoever the voters are. But even bigger, the people are going to outsource advocacy to a small group of uh, interest group leaders, lobbyists, uh, campaign finance fundraisers, those kinds of people. There's, this is intended. Uh, Madison's view of democracy was that the people don't need to be actively engaged and participating in a very vigorous ongoing way. One of the things that we as a liberty-loving political culture, we want to have a large scope of individual freedom. Um, we want to have a big private sphere and a big uh, ra range of actions that are just for ourselves. So our public responsibilities are kept to a minimum. One of the reasons why the Madisonian model is, is, uh, sort of describes American politics very well is because Americans like uh, or tend to like the l sort of lack of direct responsibilities, the outsourcing of policy outcomes to voters or to, to even just that periodic time and then to advocates. Now, um, and, that's, and that's it. The aggregation of interests represented that produce policy outcomes are a result of one, who wins the, se the seats, and two, how the advocates can influence those people who have those uh, seats. That's what politics looks like. Now, if you've taken my interest group class, or if you're gonna take it in the future, you'll know, uh, not if you're gonna take it in the future, you won't know, but if you've taken it in the past, um, you'll know that uh, I talk about American politics as essentially an interest group struggle. And the struggle is to, one, get as many sympathetic representatives elected as possible, and two, whoever gets elected, to, to influence those uh, elected officials or those, those uh, office holders as effectively as possible. And that that's fundamentally what American politics is. Now, there is some collaboration in American politics. There is some uh, action that goes beyond this basic Madisonian Republican type model, but it's pretty, it's pretty marginal and, and off to the side. It's not central to our politics. And so I do think that that is a good way of talking about American politics. In a democratic theory class, in a democratic theory approach to uh, democracy, we can see this as a limited case, a limiting case, and, a, and one singular view of other way, or, uh, of many ways of conceptualizing and operationalizing what a democracy is supposed to be. And this is where participatory and deliberative democracy take this model, which is built into our set of institutions. Any democratic system is gonna have an electoral system, it's gonna have a governance system, it's gonna have a lot of other things uh, as well, um, it's gonna have a background political culture, but participatory and deliberative democracy take this basic model and want to add and transform certain features of it so that there's a greater sense of popular connection to policy outcomes. Now, one of the very first forms of participatory democracy that now actually doesn't even really get talked about under that uh, rubric so much is the first addition to this basic model, which is direct democracy. This is where the uh, people get to share power, right? This is a form of voting and it's also a form of power sharing. Now we don't have this at the national level in the United States, but, we, but uh, about half the states do have it. Here in Oregon we have it, where power is shared. Policy making power is shared between the system of governance, the elected representatives, and the people themselves. Either one can get a policy outcome. Now, note that this is still a relatively thin nexus that is not terribly different from the original model, right? It's still voting, which is still periodic, 
and it's still voting on a, uh, a uh, limited number of questions with a limited number of options. And usually the options are yes or no, right? A policy, yes or no. Um, that is a very uh, different kind of policy making process than exists in the system of governance where policy options are offered, alternatives are offered, amendments are made, negotiation happens, there's a whole big process that involves aggregating the represented interests. And so it's a much more complex process when legislators who ultimately vote yes or no on a proposed policy, um, or when regulators ultimately pass a particular policy, they have done so in a much more complex, rich, multi-stage, multi-dimensional process than voters who were engaged in direct democracy, where they are basically being presented with a yes or no question. And so this is, while this does increase the amount of participation, it doesn't fundamentally alter the relationship between the people and the system that's going on here. Um, what participatory democracy is looking for, so I'll put this up here, is active engagement and power sharing slash collaboration. And this is contrasted with the Madisonian model's emphasis on voting and advocacy. Right? Voting and advocacy are still part of the participatory model. Uh, there's not a claim that like, well, people shouldn't be doing those things. No, they should be doing those things, but there should be engagement and power sharing slash, slash collaboration. Direct democracy is sort of the very first, kind of most primitive step towards power sharing. As I say, it is a form of power sharing, but it's a pretty thin one. Um, what are the other forms of engagement and power sharing or collaboration that are envisioned by uh, the uh, proponents of participatory democracy? Well, one, there is an active engagement in campaigns. Not just more people voting, not just getting our voter turnout rate closer to 100%. That's really just taking this nexus of connection and broadening it to as much of society as possible. Engagement with the electoral system is, uh, and this is an expectation of participatory democracy, it's not enforceable, uh, it's not as though you can add a law or create a new process, it's an expectation that people will look at elections as more than just an opportunity to learn information and make a decision and go cast their ballot, to get engaged with connecting with campaigns, giving their time and energy to uh, candidates and causes that, that they support, spending uh, the time to network with people and connect with people to figure out what it is that they want to get engaged with in the first place, to maybe uh, be more likely to run for office, to participate in campaigns in a way that they understand what the electoral system looks like from the inside, not just from the perspective of a voter who's handed a ballot with a bunch of things that you can, that you can uh, fill out. So participatory democracy is, is uh, in this sense, it's a cultural shift that advocates that uh, the people take a bigger, play a bigger role in the electoral system than just as voters. That you're a, a voter is, is really not a participant in the electoral uh, system. A voter, a vote is a commodity. It's a thing that you give to one candidate or another or to one uh, ballot measure or another. Uh, participation is involvement in the actual process of deciding who the winners are. Right? And so this aspect of engagement is a cultural shift. Now, direct democracy is a new structure that promotes greater, uh, that promotes power sharing and presumably uh, this also promotes greater level of engagement because now voters, instead of just looking at people they're going to select to go off and are going to go into the governance system and make decisions, they themselves are playing the role in however limited and narrow of a way of policy maker. And so that will promote a greater level of engagement, of, of uh, connection with the policy question. As opposed to, I'll vote for whoever I like, whichever, uh, or you know, if I tend to vote for one party or another, or whoever seems most trustworthy, or whoever is most charismatic, or pushes my emotional buttons, whatever, and then they go make policy, right? 
when you get to vote directly, you are going to be more engaged in the policymaking process because there's more to learn when you're voting yes or no. I mean, you don't have to learn. You can just say, well, yeah, marijuana, yes, or uh, um, corporate taxes, no. But it will promote the opportunity for people to create the opportunity, and that, that opportunity will promote greater level of engagement. The power sharing uh, notion, though, adds another thing, and this is where the participatory democracy movement that first got started in the 1960s and is now seeing a sort of revival of uh, energy is in creating um, new participatory connections here, that uh, there is power sharing and collaboration between citizen groups and the system of governance. Um, so, for example, uh, there's a, this concept of participatory budgeting, right? Under the traditional model, budgets are passed by elected representatives. Uh, the concept of participatory budgeting is that some part of the budget is set aside for a citizen board to determine the use of and that that citizen board is drawn from the population as a whole and there are ample opportunities for people to get involved. It's not just a new form of governance that you have to get elected to and the representatives, the winners get to decide. Um, it is a way of saying regular people are going to be involved in a process that's, a, that's normally set aside for uh, um, professional, or excuse me, elected uh, uh, or appointed officials, professionals who are paid to be in the system of governance. Um, another example that's actually getting a, getting a lot of attention now with criminal justice reform uh, in the forefront of many people's minds is citizen oversight boards, right? Citizens whose job is to pay attention to what is going on in the system of governance and the, the uh, power of overseeing the way that policy is implemented is shared by official government employees and the citizen oversight boards. Um, this is yet another opportunity for people to participate in a way where they don't have to say, well, I'm going to run for office and if I win, then I'll, get, I'll have the power to make decisions. It is a way of creating a new opportunity for citizens to get involved in the process of deciding what policy outcomes are, are, are going to be that doesn't involve having to run for office, having to win office, or having to get appointed uh, to a particular position, or having to get hired uh, through the civil service uh, system. So the idea is, and this is, this is really the big one, is that there are institutions, bodies, boards, uh, uh, um, community organizations that are connected to the system of governance, not just added to the inside of the system of government, but connected to it in a way that allows citizens to not just advocate to elected officials or appointed officials, but to actually themselves participate in the decision-making process. Um, now, there's already the opportunity to participate in the decision-making process by advocating. Um, but there is a big difference between, well, okay, I'm going to be a lobbyist or I'm, gonna, I'm going to, as a private citizen, go to the state capitol and try to influence elected officials to pass a policy uh, or to defeat a policy that I don't like. And having the ability to join a group, be a member of a group that itself will have some or all of policymaking power uh, to decide on policy outcomes. And that is really what the participatory democracy movement is about. It's about creating things like citizens' assemblies, oversight boards, uh, um, budgeting uh, commissions that are open to popular participation. Uh, that's what participatory democracy means. It means putting into regular life, into an ongoing way, opportunities for people to get involved and not just vote or lobby. Um, <clears throat> and the idea being, that this will then promote greater engagement, right? So we can promote greater engagement culturally by saying people ought to get more involved in the electoral system, people ought to advocate more, there ought to be a greater level of citizen engagement. But then participatory democracy then asks also to add uh, organizations uh, and institutions that are quasi-governmental or, or, or uh, outside of government that will increase the power sharing mechanisms 
in our democratic system. And that that will have a feedback loop on engagement. Um, if citizens can decide on 5% of a city budget, for example, through a citizen uh, participatory budgeting uh, process, then people are going to say, oh, there's tens of millions of dollars that could be spent in ways that we, not the city council, but we get to, get to promote and decide. Well, that's worth my time of getting involved in politics. As opposed to, well, the city sets the budget and my one vote for city council members or mayor is pretty small, so why would I even pay attention? They're gonna do what they do and they're influenced by big money interests and by power brokers and by the heads of interest groups that, that are large like unions and the chambers of commerce, so why get involved? When there's actually an opportunity for direct involvement, um, then uh, there, there will, it will promote that kind of engagement. Um, at at a PSU, this kind of thing happens in hiring processes uh, for deans and for faculty and for the president is that the committees that make, that do the hiring, that uh, read the, uh, the, the applications and decide who the finalists are and do all the interviewing, those groups share power with student, uh, um, student uh, volunteers who can get involved not just in advocating, saying, hey, we like this professor uh, to be hired for this, or we want this person to be the president, but who are part of the discussion, who are in the room, who are there for the interviews. Um, and that is a form of participatory uh, hiring that is relatively common now at public universities um, and is an analogous form of, ex of, a, of sort of extended participation in the decision-making process. Now, deliberative democracy, is about how it is that decisions are made within the democratic institutions and processes. Deliberative democracy promotes deliberation over negotiation. And negotiation is really the fundamental political dynamic of the Madisonian model. That's what goes on here to create policy outcomes. Elected officials, the winners, uh, represent various interests from around society. They come together and they negotiate within their caucuses and they negotiate between different factions to promote policy uh, ideas that they have. And that's what politics is. State legislatures, city councils, the United States Congress is a negotiating body. And the voters are voting for the people who are gonna to get to do the negotiating. And the reason why you want uh, the candidates that you like to win rather than to lose is because you want somebody there, you want as many people there to be involved in negotiating as possible. One of the things about negotiation is this is a clash of interests. And that is what Madison envisioned is gonna happen anyway. In his view of human nature, humans are going to always try to advance their interests. It's built into us. And so when we, when we create a system of uh, popular government, that's not gonna change. People are still gonna to wanna to advance their interests. And that's why checks and balances are so important, and that's why the nature of the electoral system is so important, is that we wanna create a way that people's interests can clash in a way that we get the aggregate of those interests and that the will of the people will result from a negotiation that between these clashing interests. And that's what politics is and is supposed to be. And it can't be any other way. This is where Madison's conception of human nature is such that that's what humans are like. That we are built to promote our interests, and so if people get in the way of our interests, we're gonna try to win that battle, they're gonna try to win that battle, and democracy will end up being, as any political system is, but democracy will end up being a clash of uh, interests. Deliberative democracy asks people who are participating in the decision-making process to view policy outcomes not as either advancing or hindering their interests, but as either advancing or hindering the public good, the common good, uh, social goals. And so what deliberation is, is it's a clash of ideas and opinions. And there, the difference here is, is this, is that when you deliberate with people, you don't have a predetermined thing that you want and 
Part of the process is to figure out how to best negotiate to get that outcome. How to use the leverage that you have, how to be clever, uh, how to influence uh, people uh, who, are, who have different interests than you. When you're deliberating, that's a collective process of coming together to decide what's best, not who's the winner. And that's the difference. Here we get winners and losers. Here the question is, what's best for us all? Deliberation is a mindset. So is negotiation. And basically what deliberative uh, um, Democrats are asking for from voters, representatives, advocates, all forms, uh, all people, all participants in uh, any democratic process is to bring to the process an idea that we are, whoever the we is, are coming together to decide what's best for all. We're not coming together to try to win or to try to get as much as we can, to try to get the closest thing to a win. So it's a collective effort rather than a competition. Right, um, and uh, the idea being that people will have a clash. Right, there's no reason not to have a clash. Not everybody's going to agree. Right. Okay. So let's say that we uh, are facing, um, you know, a, a global pandemic. What's the best way to do this? What's the best way to address this problem? Some people are going to say, well, the best way to address this problem is to require people to have masks to put as many resources as we possibly can into finding a vaccine, to uh, providing money for uh, healthcare resources so that when a lot of people get sick, there's not healthcare overwhelm. Other people are gonna say, no, the way to deal with the pandemic is to just kind of let it burn its course through us and let people decide how they individually and as families want to address this. Uh, and let's just, let's just let it play out. Now, that those two opinions are going to, and other opinions in between those two, are going to result in a clash. If people come saying, well, my opinion is, my, is what I want, and the more of that that I get, the more of a winner I am, um, that's going to lead to a clash of interests, right? A clash of opinions is like, well, I think that's true. I'm going to listen to other people's opinions and with an open mind, and I'm going to pay attention to why it is that they might be a leg that, that that idea might be a legitimate idea to, to have. Not you're an opponent of mine. You're trying to get something that you want. I'm trying to get something that I want. And so, rather than listening to you and why you have that position, I'm going to do the best I can to uh, to win this particular negotiation. It's a mindset attitude. Right. Um, imagine that you come to class to a, to 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 a college class, and you have a set of opinions. Let's say it's a, let's say it's a it's a it's a literature class, and you have a set of opinions about uh, certain kinds of novels. That novels that are essentially plotless novels that are heavily thematic and that really just are about people and feelings, uh, um, not about plot and uh, um, action. If you have have the opinion that that is uh, bad, that it's annoying, you don't like it, right? And you come to class ready to essentially hold that opinion and argue that opinion, you're going to have a different kind of experience with that class than if you come into class with that opinion, right? You might come into the class with that opinion like, you know what, I just like plot-driven, action-driven fiction. Um, I don't get why people might like plotless, thematic, uh, feelings-oriented type of literature. When you come with an open mind to that, let's say that that's what the professor is either promoting or that's just one of the things that they talk about. If you come into it with, a, with an open mind, you still have your opinion. You don't have to come into it with no opinion. But if you come into it with an open mind, you might at the end be like, oh, I never looked at it that way. And when you're trying to argue with somebody about why one thing is superior to another, you're not going to hear the real reasons. You're gonna look for opportunities to provide counter arguments uh, against them. That's seeing, that's experiencing a college class as a negotiation or an argument in that case, instead of an open-minded uh, um, exploration of a topic. Now, when you have an open mind, 
to other people's opinions and why they might hold them and the reasons why that opinion might be a good one. That doesn't mean that you're going to be squishy and you're just gonna switch your opinion to what other people think. It means that you are going to genuinely take in their perspective, their arguments, uh, their viewpoints, and make your analysis. And you are going to advocate for your opinion even as you're being open-minded. So deliberation is not about letting other people run roughshod of you who have stronger opinions or not having your opinions matter. It's about being, having it, it be uh, the, the, the discussion be an open-minded exploration. And you may end up with your mind staying the same and you may end up with your mind being changed or some kind of combination of the two of those things. Now, deliberation, doesn't mean that you can decide policy questions just by discussing open-mindedly and exploring. Ultimately, a decision has to get made. And in either of these models, unless there's a consensus that emerges, which is really not gonna happen very often, there's going to be a point where voting has to take place, right? You have to cast a ballot. Let's say it's a city council debate over whether or not to uh, you know, change the way that police are trained to deal with domestic disputes, right? That, some, that policy is going to get made or it's going to fail, uh, whichever is the case. Ultimately, unless the members of the city council can come to some kind of an agreement through discussion, there will need to be a vote. And the majority rules or some kind of supermajority requirement will obtain. And so that doesn't, deliberative democracy doesn't mean there's no voting. It doesn't mean there's no ultimate counting up of the, of the majority uh, viewpoint. What it means is that prior to that moment, the approach of the decision makers, the, the, those who have the votes, the city council members, the approach is going to be one of clashing ideas and opinions, a question, what's, what is the best approach here? Um, and you have a different opinion than I have, and let's discuss it. I want to find out why you believe what you believe. You want to find out, find out why I believe what I believe. We're going to pay attention to the fact that maybe we haven't seen everything. Um, and uh, at the end, we're probably going to have to vote, and it's not going to be 100% uh, consensus in, on one side or the other, so there will be winners or losers. But that democratic process will be different. It will feel and look different and will, in some cases, produce different policy outcomes than if the people who are in the decision-making body go into it as a negotiation. Because when you're negotiating, it's foolish to have an open mind. It's foolish to be exploratory. It's foolish to try to look at things from someone else's point of view. Because as the more and more you do that, the more you're going to end up sliding away from your own interests that you're trying to promote. Uh, so, it, in the end, there'll have to be some kind of vote in the city council, in the state legislature, in Congress. But the way that people go about the process of deciding how they're going to vote uh, will look quite different. Now, one of the other features of both participatory and deliberative democracy um, is that uh, there is an underlying value of inclusivity. I'm going to put that under both sides here. Part of the idea of increasing engagement is to get more people involved, right? More opportunities to influence the outcomes, more opportunities to get involved in the electoral system, more opportunities to share power with the elected uh, and appointed representatives means that there's going to be a greater inclusion of people who have uh, traditionally marginalized perspectives, lifestyles, uh, existence, uh, um, minorities, women, poor people, uh, uh, immigrants, anyone that's been sort of traditionally marginalized from the uh, standard uh, political system is going to have more opportunities and more influence and so we're going to get greater inclusivity. Deliberative democracy absolutely promotes greater inclusivity because if you're going to have an open-minded exploration of a policy question, um, it's invaluable to have as many different perspectives as possible. One of the things that has often been a problem with state legislatures and Congress is that the vast majority of, of uh, legislators, elected like legislators, are white men, which have a pretty narrow perspective, um, but also come from a small group of professions. Most 
uh, uh, members of Congress are, either doctors or lawyers, far more lawyers than doctors, but there are a lot of doctors. Many of them are professionals of some kind, accountants or uh, uh, small business people. What there aren't a lot of in uh, Congress, and uh, there's more in state legislatures and more still in city councils, but still not a whole lot, are non-white males, people who aren't professionals, people who are working people, people who, who are poor, not just come from a poor background and became successful, but who are actually poor or who are middle class, um, people who uh, have a range of different uh, backgrounds and experiences. That is a sort of problematic artifact of our electoral system as well as uh, the inherent power, the, the implicit power structures and biases in our broader culture. It's harder for women to win uh, election. It's harder for people who aren't white to win election for a variety of reasons. Um, all of that exclusion attenuates the kinds of viewpoints and perspectives that can be brought to a deliberation. So even if we have a deliberative democracy, even if the people who are in the decision-making councils go into it with an open-minded, exploratory uh, um, sensibility and discuss and uh, de really deliberate with, with others, if there's an, a narrow range of perspective and experience, they're not gonna have a full deliberation, a full exploration of the question, what's best for all? Because you don't know what other people's experiences are like. Right? I'm an upper middle class, well-educated white male of a certain age. Right? There are lots of people's experience that I have no idea about. Now I could guess, I could read about it, but it would be really, really useful if I could actually hear it directly from people who have that lived experience. Right? I've done a decent amount of reading about how it is that uh, people of color are treated by various government institutions, healthcare, uh, police, uh, um, uh, city councils, uh, social workers, all that. And I can read about it and I can be like, okay, there seems to be some unfairness and some lack of perspective, but I, don't, I haven't had the experience of having to interact with a, uh, with a social welfare bureaucrat from the point of view of being a poor woman of color or being a wealthy uh, woman, uh, white woman, right? I don't have either of those experiences. I don't have any of those other experiences. So I can guess, but I can't know. And so part of deliberative democracy really requires that the uh, democratic system inspire and allow more and more different types of people with different experiences and different perspectives, not just different opinions, but different places in society, different backgrounds, different family experiences, different ethnicities, different uh, um, educations, different uh, training, right? Uh, people who, you know, work in factories as well as people who are professional doctors, lawyers, accountants, uh, that type of thing. Deliberative democracy absolutely requires that to have decent outcomes because otherwise you're going to, even if you have a clash of opinions, if, if all those opinions come from a very narrow band of society, you're not really going to get the answer, what's best for all. You're not really going to find what the will of the people is or what is in the common good. You're going to find the white male's version of that, which may be close to the, ver to the full version, but it's never going to be that full version. So inclusivity is absolutely an important uh, thing. Now, some of this stuff can be done through formal changes to our democratic system, particularly here, right? Power sharing uh, and collaboration mechanisms are uh, possible. We can also have changes that will make it more likely that people will get engaged in the electoral system. Um, for example, uh, public uh, funding of elections or uh, small dollar donation matching are uh, policies that could promote greater engagement, right? If, if I knew that I could donate $10 to a campaign and that $10 was gonna turn into a match of $90 from uh, the city or the state, then I would have an incentive to give that $10 and I would have an incentive to pay attention to where that money was going because that money was gonna, is gonna be leveraged. It's not just $10 out of my pocket, it's $100 towards a cause and so I'm gonna have an incentive to pay more attention. I'm also going to then have an opportunity to be like, okay, I'll donate $10 to this cause, they'll get $98 extra and I'll then also donate some time to uh, this particular cause or this particular candidate because I only had to kick in $10 uh, and now I can kick in some of my time as well. So there are some mechanisms that can be changed to promote participation and deliberation, but also to a certain extent, both participatory and deliberative democracy require a cultural shift. 
a change in view from the ballot-centric view of democracy. That democracy is about voting and that majority rules is the main mechanism of democratic decision making. Voting is important. Majority rules has to happen at a certain point when there's uh, clashes, usually at the end of the process, right before policy outcomes are decided. But if, to the extent that we think of that as not just being the beginning of democracy, but the end of democracy, that's a sort of limitation on a vigorous democratic culture. So participatory and deliberative democracy are related but separate ideas that are asking for people in a democratic society to see their membership in that society in bigger terms than the Madisonian model. Madison thought that people were just going to interact with the political system in this way, and to a certain extent the system that we have set up has promoted that particular kind of uh, interaction. We tend to see ourselves as just voters. Uh, we tend to see uh, our interactions with the democratic system as the ballot box every year or two years, or if people who only vote in presidential elections every four years. Um, we tend to see our connections to uh, the system of electoral system, the system of governance as being very attenuated. And that will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we see ourselves that way, then we're gonna act that way and that's what's gonna happen. Advocates of participatory and deliberative democracy want people to see their uh, connection to the democratic system as being much broader 